attention to what you hear. Watch this now. By the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And more will be added to you. For whoever has, more will be given to him. And here's the part we don't like. And whoever does not have, even what he or she does have will be. That, that's Jesus, not Pastor Solomon, right? That, that was in your Bible when you came, wasn't it? Amen. With God's help this morning, I want to preach and teach from the thought, the secrets of the kingdom. Why don't you repeat it after me? Say, the secrets of the kingdom. We know this story pretty well. In Mark chapter 4, a large crowd had gathered beside the sea to hear Jesus preach. So many folks had showed up to hear him that the Bible says he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea while the crowd was on the land beside the sea. I don't know, to be honest, y'all, I, I don't know if Jesus had a title for his sermon that day. But if he did, maybe he would call it the parable of the sower. But, but in his message, he talked about a sower. We, we would call him a farmer who, who's planting seeds into the ground. And, and all the seeds fell on one of four different types of soils. How, how many different types of soils? Jesus says that some seed fell on what he calls the path or the pathway and never reached the soil. So, so the birds swooped down and ate the seed. Other seed fell on rocky ground, and rocky ground is, is a patch of ground where there's a thin layer of soil covering solid rock, which made it impossible. Somebody say impossible. It made it impossible for the roots of the plant to grow. So some of the other seeds fell on ground where thorny weeds made it difficult for the seed to flourish. But the seed that fell on good ground eventually produced an abundant harvest. Yeah. Now, at this point, Jesus closed his sermon notes, gave the benediction, and sent the crowds home. Now, brother deacons, if, if the crowds in that day were anything like church folks today, they, they probably had mixed opinions about Jesus' message. Some, some folks probably went home confused. Others went home excited. Some of the people went home inspired. They went home feeling good. The only problem was that they did not understand the message. I said they did not understand the message. Come on now, y'all. Pe people often come up to me and say, Pastor Solomon, we had a time yesterday in church. Then, then they go on to tell me how well their choir sang or how their praise team led them into the presence of God. Some folks talk about how the people shouted and danced in the spirit and spoke in tongues. Some even share how they were slain in the spirit when their pastor or their bishop laid hands on them. Other people tell me about what politician or famous entertainer showed up at church on a particular Sunday. But when I ask what their bishop or pastor preached about, 
and what scripture he or she preached from, many of those same folks couldn't answer. They, they would just say, I don't know. Boy, he or she sure did preach this morning. Now, as I begin to reflect on these conversations, I begin to realize that, hear me y'all, that it's possible for you and me to hear a message, to be inspired by that message, to be encouraged by that message, to be impressed by the message, and still not understand the message. But if you and I are going to be serious about being disciples of Jesus, how many of you are serious about walking with the Lord now? Amen? Amen. If, if, if you and I are going to be serious about being disciples of Jesus, we can't be satisfied with just having a good time at church. Amen. We can't be satisfied with just having a good feeling about being in the presence of Jesus. We must have an unwavering desire to understand the message. Somebody say understand the message. We, we must have an unwavering desire to apply the message to our lives. You and I must have a desire to understand this morning. What does all this seed and soil stuff got to do with us? I'm in the text, y'all. Look again at verse 10. You still got your Bible open? Look at verse 10. Je Jesus' true disciples also wanted to know what does this message have to say about me, my life, and my relationship to God? And, and since they couldn't stand up in the middle of Jesus' sermon to ask him to explain the meaning of the message, the disciples went to speak to him when he was alone after church. And, and if your imagination works with you, I, I can imagine them saying, Jesus... I need to ask you a few questions, my brother, about that sermon that you preach. We, we've never heard you speak in parables before. What does this parable mean? And look at what Jesus, look how Jesus responds in verses 11 and 12. Watch this now. He answered them. Somebody say them. He answered them. Who are them? Them is referring to those disciples who came to ask him about the meaning of the parable. He answered them. Somebody say them. Yeah. He answered them. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those outside, everything comes in parables so that they may indeed look and yet not perceive. They may indeed listen and yet not understand. Otherwise, they might turn back and be forgiven. Does that disturb you like it disturbs me? In, in other words, Jesus says, this parable is a window for some and a warning to others. It, it's, it's a window for those with open hearts. And it's a warning for the hard-hearted. This, this, this parable like a window will give fuller illumination and revelation to some. You, you know, a window allows us to 
Come on, now the window allows you to do what? But this same parable serves as a warning of judgment for others. And it all depends on our reaction to the message. You see, when Jesus goes on to explain the parable in verses 13 to 20, he says that the sower sows the seed. And the seed is the word of God. Somebody say the word of God. Every one of us is receiving the same seed. I said all of us are receiving the same seed. But the issue that determines whether the seed grows to maturity in our lives is the condition of the soil. Which is the condition of our And so Jesus is challenging you and I. Jesus is challenging us to think about which of these soils represents the condition of our hearts. But please notice, please notice. Jesus didn't explain the meaning of this parable to everybody. Come on, am I, am I in the Bible or what? Jesus did not explain the meaning of the parable to everybody. He only explained the parable to those who came seeking for understanding. He, he gave deeper spiritual insight to those who had a spiritual hunger and a spiritual thirst for more knowledge. The, these are the folks. Who are not satisfied with a surface knowledge of the word of God. They, they don't just want to know what the word says. They want to know what it means. And it was because his disciples had this type of attitude. That Jesus says that they, them, they could receive the mysteries. Or the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Are y'all hearing this this morning? To, to, to put it another way. Jesus is telling us. All of us. Jesus is teaching us. Who is eligible to receive the secret counsel of the Lord. How many of you know that God has secrets? I bet I better say it real low because we're talking about secrets, right? I said the God we serve has secrets. And guess what, church? God don't share his secrets. With everybody. He just like. We just like him. How many of y'all tell y'all secrets to everybody? Oh y'all don't want to help me preach now. Huh? Okay. How many of you show your secrets with everybody? Okay. Y'all looking at me strange. Write it down. Psalm 25 verse 14. Psalm, Psalm 25, verse 14. We can go through a whole lot of verses, but we don't have time. Y'all don't want me to stay up here too long. Psalm 25, verse 14 says that the secret of the Lord or the secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him. It ain't for everybody. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him and God makes known to them his covenant. Amen, somebody. Is, is there anybody here this morning who wants Jesus to share with you the secrets of the kingdom of God? Is, is there anybody?
somebody here who really wants to hear the word of the Lord. You see, this is beyond church here we talked about. See, to, to put it another way, we can know what the kingdom of God is like. We can know how one enters the kingdom. We can know the importance of God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. We, we can now position ourselves to understand the 14 different secrets or the 14 mystery doctrines revealed to us in the New Testament. Fourteen secrets right under your nose. Why? Because those disciples who hunger and thirst for knowledge and understanding of the gospel qualify to receive the secrets of the kingdom of God. That, that's why, y'all, that's why when we preach and proclaim the message of God's kingdom, it's like, we just read it, it's, it's like bringing an oil lamp into a dark room. You, you ever been in a dark room before and then the light comes on? Just, well, Jesus says that when we preach God's message, it's like bringing a lamp into a dark room. Look, look, look what he says, 21 to 22, one more time. He says, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not put there to be put up on a lampstand. Here it is. For there is nothing hidden. That will not be revealed. There is nothing concealed. That will not be brought to light. I, I love this y'all. Jesus says. Stay with me y'all. Jesus says. That the purpose of the gospel. Is to reveal truth. And to expose error. Can, can I say that again? What, what is the purpose of the gospel? The purpose of the gospel is to reveal the truth. But also to expose the error. He, he says. Okay y'all looking at me strange. He says that the preaching of the gospel. Exposes. Somebody say exposes. It exposes the hidden things of the heart. It, it, it exposes hidden sins that are not visible to the natural eye. That, that's why verse 22 says that the true condition of our heart is made manifest when it's confronted by the light of the gospel. And so, the only question is, I know y'all don't like this kind of preaching. But we need it, y'all. We need it. We, the, the only question that remains is, how then should we respond? Now, if, if we can be qualified to receive the secret, how should we respond when it comes? Well, Jesus answers this question in 24 and 25. If you don't hear nothing else, Wake up and get this part, please. Verse 24 and 25. He says, somebody say, pay attention. Pay attention. Come on, say it like you mean. Say, pay attention. pay attention. Pay attention to what you hear. By the measure, somebody say, you use. You use. Or somebody say, by the measure I use. Let's make it personal. By, by the measure I use, it will be measured back to. And more will be added to. For, for whoever has, more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Now, 
The, these two verses teach us, Reverend Calhoun, they, they teach us how we should react when Jesus reveals heaven's secrets. We, how are we to react? We are to stand in awe. A-W-E. Write it down. We should stand in awe. In awe of these divine revelations that bring joy and satisfaction to our soul. And so, I want to give you three principles that form the acronym of A-W-E. A is for attitude. Somebody say attitude. W is for work. Somebody say work. And E is for expectation. Let me run through these real quick. And I'm out your way. The first principle is what is our attitude towards what we hear? Look, look at verse 24 again. This is the first part of verse 24. Jesus says, pay attention to what you hear. But, but Deacon Brown, when, when we read this same verse in Luke's version, Luke 8, 18, Jesus says, take care how you hear. And so, what Jesus is saying is that it's good to be able to remember what you and I hear preached. But it's just as important to examine how we hear. Because the verse goes on to say, the measure you use will be measured back to you. Now, to understand what he's saying. It's helpful to compare scriptures with scripture. Yep. Now, you, we all know Luke 6.38, where Jesus says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and shall men give unto your bosom. Here it is, for with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to So, Jesus in Luke 6.38, listen, is speaking about our attitude towards giving. We'll get quiet when we start talking about giving. <laughs> and, and his point is that our attitude towards what we give and how much we give is in direct proportion to what we receive back. Why? Because Jesus says the measure that you use. The measure that you use will be measured back to. So if you're cheap or if you're stingy. Don't expect to receive an abundance of return. Amen, somebody. Because whatever measure you use will determine what comes back to. Am I in the Bible? Okay. Let me give you another example. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Jesus said, we, we love this one. Everyone got this one memorized. Judge not. Folk don't know where Genesis is. In the Bible, but they know, judge not. One day we're going to preach. Matthew said, but judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to. Same words, right? So, once again, we hear this phrase about the measure that we use. And so, Jesus is teaching.
teaching us here about our attitude toward judging other people. Which, which means that if, if I'm harsh, if I'm judgmental, and I have a condemning attitude toward other people, then I will be treated in much the same way, not by y'all, but by Why? Because with the measure that I use, it will be measured back to? Are y'all praying with me this morning? Now, we looked at giving and we looked at judging. When we apply this same principle to Jesus' words in Mark chapter 4, we must ask ourselves the question, what should our attitude be towards what we hear preached faithfully from the scriptures? Now, I'm not talking about this nonsense from the pulpit. I'm talking about faithful preaching. Well, the Apostle Paul says, write it down, 1 First, First Thessalonians 2.13. We don't have time to look at it. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, And we also thank God constantly for this. Here it is. That when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as the word of man, but as it really is the word of God, which is at work in every believer. First Thessalonians 2.13. Paul says, when you hear the faithful preaching and teaching of the biblical gospel, you're not hearing human philosophy or the opinions or the thoughts of the preacher. You're hearing the very word of God. And God's word must be obeyed. And, and when this is our attitude toward God's word, God will bless our lives with his presence and increase our understanding of who God is and our understanding of God's truth. The, the second principle, I wish I could stay here. The second principle is also found in verse 24. Look at the end of verse 24. I love this part. He says, and more. Somebody say more. more. And more will be added to you. I just like the sound of that part. Somebody say, more, more. will be added yeah. to me. In other words, when, when we receive the word with the right attitude, Shonda, the, the word begins to transform our hearts. Somebody say, more will be added. More. You, you just heard the verse. The word of God is at work. The word of God is at work in the lives of those, watch this, who believe the word. Do I have any believers here this morning? Well, if you are a believer, when you hear the word, the word, the Bible says, is at work in you. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 puts it another way. For, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in us. Both the will and the doing of his good pleasure. God is at work in us. I, I may not look like much to you. But God is at work 
work in me. Now, you, you may not be impressed, but guess what? God is at work in me. And, and because he's at work, you just keep watching. I don't look like much now, but let God keep working. Does anybody here know what it means to be changed by the word of God? Come on, don't play with me. Do you know what it means to be changed by God's word? Well, if, if you can testify to how God's word is working to change your life, then you can help me close this message this morning because the third and the final principle is found in verse 25. God's expectation. You know God expects something of his people, don't you? God, God's expectation for those of us who hear. You see, because of what God has added to our lives. ever added anything to your life come on now don't play with me it, it, because of what God has added to your life God has an expectation for your life God is looking for fruit I said God is looking for fruit to, to put it another way the person who hears the word with the right attitude, will bear fruit 30-fold, yeah. yeah. 60-fold, and 100-fold, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Be because Jesus died on the cross, God has forgiven us of our sins. And because he died, God added to our lives. I said God added to our lives. God added the fruit of the Spirit. God added the gifts of the Spirit. God gave us a new purpose for living. God freed us from the guilt and the shame of our past. God restored us and God gave us a living hope because Jesus is alive from the dead. That's why. <laughs> that's why. We can now bless those who curse us. Because God word. Is bearing fruit in our lives. That, that's why I'm learning to love my enemies. Because God's word is bearing fruit in my life. That, that's why we stop thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Because God's word is bearing fruit in our lives. We, we've stopped loving things and using people. Is the mic on? We have stopped loving things and using people. Why? Because God is bearing fruit in our lives. I, I stopped stealing and learned to work with my hands because God's word is bearing fruit in my life. Okay, okay, all right. I'm not as mean and orony as I used to be. Why? Because God's word is at work in my life and I am bearing new fruit. Okay, this, this ain't for none of us here, but I no longer tell bold-faced lies anymore. jumping in bed with folks just because they smile at me. Why? Because my life is producing the fruit of holiness 
and righteousness. 25 says again that the one who already has knowledge of God's word will understand it better and God will give him more. And the one who doesn't listen carefully or the one who does not have will lose even what they already heard. No wonder you can't remember what pastor preached last week. In fact, Jesus implies that if we depend on ourselves instead of God, even what we think we have will be taken away. But perhaps that's why Jesus says, to whom much is given, much is required. I'm done, y'all, but God wants us to be in awe of him and his word. That's what Jesus said for whoever has ears to hear, let him or her hear. He wants us to have the proper attitude towards the word of God. God wants to do a work in our hearts and lives through the power of the word. And God expects us to bear fruit as we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We must kneel in awe before him. Why? Because God is awesome. Come on, stand on your feet this morning. Anybody know that God is awesome this morning? <laughs> to us, have been given the secrets of the kingdom. God is calling us to deeper levels of relationship, Corinthian. God wants to be closer to us. God, God doesn't want to be used. Anybody know what it is to be used in a relationship? They only call when they want something. You know, I, I must be from Mars or something. Y'all know some good people, but where I'm from, know some folks that only call when they want something. But when I'm looking for them, call block. I was in the hospital for four months, man. You missed me. Man, I wish you would have called me. I'd have been right there. The Bible says that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. The Bible says that, that a friend loves at all times. Good times, bad times. And, and here's the point of the message. When you have that type of friendship with God in Christ, God shares secrets. Secrets about your life. God, why, why did that have to happen to me? I was just a child. God, God, what would you have me to do with my life? I'm, God, I, I, I'm over 60. I, I'm done. Everything, I think my life is over. God says, I got a secret for you too. That eternal life is forever. So you can get started at 90 and experience the fullness of life. The doors of the church are open to you today.
Is there one? He came that we would have life and that we would live it to the fullest. As the choir sings. Church ought to pray. Somebody's at a crossroads in their life. Lord, touch this morning. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. And all. Last call. You may already be a Christian. You may already be saved. But you need a church home. The doors of Corinthian are open to you as well. Is there one this morning? Come on, let's sing it together. He has done. Great. Bless his holy name. As we prepare for God's blessings and benediction, I pray. That this message will disturb your sleep as it's disturbed mine. That the word of God will shake us out of our complacency. God could give you so much more if he, if he could trust you with more. He said if you're faithful over little, I'll make you ruler over much. But if you're not managing what you have, won't you bow your heads as we look for God's blessings and benediction. Father, we thank you for this day and for your word. We pray that your word has found good ground in our hearts. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in our hearts, both now and forevermore. Let us all sing together. peace brother Nicholas brother Nick